Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Refuge. Welcome to Sunday morning. Thank you for making it through the obstacle course that uh, presents itself on, on the way into the building. Work with the county continues to go along well. And for anyone who's new, I'm James, pastor here. As you guys are settling in, we will bring things to order. And today's service is going to be a little bit different, as sometimes we do. Obviously, the elements are here, so it is Communion Sunday, so we'll be participating of that together. But we're also going to be having a little bit different service and a mixture of song and scripture as we look at the verses and values that really drive us, not just as Refuge Church, but honestly, just as Christians. And we're going to be looking at the question, what do we value as a church? What do we value as Christians? What do we value as a community? And what do we value in light of God's great commission? And so we're going to be looking at those core values that we have. If you guys got a bulletin when you walked in, there are some sermon notes, uh, things talking about what's happening. But on the back of those, there are, there are some fill-ins, not just of our values, but also the key verses that go along with those if you would like to study those during the week. And so we're actually going to alternate a little bit. I apologize to anyone whose knees are feeling a little wobbly, but today's service by nature will have a little more standing and sitting as we sing songs together and take a break then to meditate on our values as a church and then particip participate in the elements of communion together. And so let's open up in a word of prayer as we begin to prepare our hearts and our minds for the receiving of the basics of what we believe. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can come together for a special service today. Just music a little bit different, meditations a little bit different. And God, we always want to think through clearly what and why we gather, how we worship, why we worship, but God, no matter how we worship, it needs to be in spirit and in truth. And so we ask your Holy Spirit to help us this morning, not to let words come off our tongues that are rote or that we have, we have said a hundred times before. Not just ideas that are good to live by, but truly let, let our hearts be spirit-filled. Let our words be be truth as they come out. Truth because of what they say, but also truth because we believe. Truth for us in light of the capital T truth that is you and your son, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you this morning that we can come together as God's people and worship you. And I'm thankful that we can begin by celebrating and in fact saying all hail to the power of Jesus' name. We say in your name, amen. Let's all rise now and sing our first song together.
Amen. You may be seated. Crown and Lord of all, all hail Jesus is a great way to start any meditation on what we value, making sure that he is at the center. Which brings us really to our first three values where we're going to camp probably for the longest amount of time, because if we truly see Jesus as crown, what does that mean? It's easy to imagine a crown, it's easy to imagine a celebration, it's, it's easy to imagine perhaps standing before him and seeing that crown being put on the Jesus head. But if we truly see him as crowned, what that represents is he is over us. He's not over us, he's also central to us. In fact, he's central to everything about our lives in such a way that it should be radiating outward through us and to others. John 1 gives us a beautiful portrait of God sending His Son to be with us. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who are we talking about? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, not anything was made that was made. And then it says clearly to tell us who we're talking about. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Every child in our Sunday school knows the right answer is Jesus. That's, of course, who we're talking about. He was with God. He was God. He created all through the power of the Word of God. He created and brought the universe into existence became flesh, and so Jesus becomes central. He's the Word, and is given us, as he articulates to a couple of guys on the road to Emmaus, he's also given us his written Word in the Old Testament and then the story of the Gospels in the New Testament. And that's why the first thing that we focus on as a church, the first thing we say, well, what do we value? Always appears at the top of the list. Something that will say, Together, and that's the centrality of God's Word. Say these words with me. We value God's Word as our only perfect source for faith, belief, and conduct. The reading, teaching, and application of the Bible is essential to following Jesus. Here's our key verse behind that. A lot of you know this in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. But it's good to keep handy if somebody asks you why. All Scripture is breathed out by God. See how that dovetails with that idea of the living Word. The same Word of God that spoke everything into existence has given us Scripture which is breathed out by God. The Word of God literally breathed out and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Those middle ones we don't like so much all the time. Profitable for teaching, awesome, training, yes, reproof and correction. That the man of God may be what? Complete, equipped for every good work. On the, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus showed up after his death and resurrection, talking with two guys who didn't recognize him. And he walked through the Old Testament scriptures and taught how it all pointed to him. If we believe in Jesus and look to him as living word, then I have to yield to his declaration about the Old Testament scriptures. And I know and believe him by the revelation in the Gospels and the New Testament. And I want you to look at that language in particular today. Sometimes, sometimes we get the idea of a good phrase like this, and it just sort of wraps us up and it feels good. But if we actually look at the language, so the man of God, a person may be what? Complete. Turn that around for a minute. Without God's word, what does that mean? Without God's word, I am incomplete. I'm incomplete and insufficient as an entity, as a creature, as a person, as a human. I am absolutely insufficient and not whole without God's Word. I have no center. I have no standard. I have no source. I have no objective foundation. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's not just that I'm incomplete without God's Word. It discerns me and it defines my identity. Right? And, and even more than that, even more than just giving me center and giving me identity, it defines and demands movement. And that's why we have our second value, which these are not separable. 
The second one is a life transforming walk with Jesus. Say this with me together. We're imperfect people continually changing as a result of Christ's presence and direct influence in our lives. He provides our new identity, free from sin and guilt, growing together with Christ and one another. Key verse is where James, actually Jesus' brother, who wrote a book of our Bible, says in chapter 1, verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then there's that harsh phrase at the end of it. Don't be, doer, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. All right, Psalm 119, David puts it in a much more encouraging way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my what? My path. I'm headed in a direction. Without God's word, I'm incomplete. It discerns me and defines my identity. And if I truly believe it, it will determine certain direction and actions that are different from the world around me. It has specific direction for my life and my actions. Matthew 7, 24, Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. So we need to hear and doing as a part of someone who truly believes. That's what scripture tells us. But how do we hear? Right? Everyone who then hears. Well, that means I have to hear it. How do we hear and how do others hear? That's why number three is so important and can't be separated from those first two. Or we're just spinning in our own sort of self, isolated, alone, walled up. Number three is sharing God's good news. What do we say together, believers? We share the greatest story that brings salvation. And we're called to build one another up in understanding and with equipping to share this news more effectively with others. Romans 10 gives us a great verse. And while we spend a lot of time at this church in particular, I think, stressing something that sometimes gets overlooked, and that's, that's God's sovereignty and God's absolute authoring of the beginning and the end and everything in between being masterfully orchestrated by him, that doesn't exempt the reality that he says he uses us as the means to his ends. He uses us as his instruments by which he achieves things. That's why Romans 10 says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they're sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. You love that? It doesn't say how beautiful are the lips or the tongue. It says how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. That's the idea that God's word is central. But also that a life with Jesus as, is walked as well as talked. The Word is more than Scripture. The Word is the living Christ. His Word is supposed to be heard and seen in us as imitators of Christ. And I would not, I would not do that. I have no compulsion to imitate Him unless truly I believe that He is absolutely worthy of imitation. Let's pause and take time to continue in song. As we ask the question, is he worthy? And here's a spoiler alert. He is. Let's stand.
from every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. Amen? Amen. All right, that song expresses how he's made us a kingdom and how he's made us a kingdom of priests to reign with his son. Here's a question for you. What, what is a kingdom? That's a multifaceted question. We won't go into all of the details of that today. But if we've been turned into a kingdom under a loving and gracious king, what that culminates in, if it's a good kingdom, is a compelling community. And that's why, as we look at our core values, if we move down to six, it's a compelling community. It's under God's gracious goodness. Let's say this together. We know that loving God means sharing lives with fellow Christians beyond worship services, enjoying benefits and shouldering burdens through interaction and accountability. We're watching a movie, Big Hero 6, with our kids Friday night. And it's, there's this beautiful little portrait of the way God loves us, but part of what he does to the main character is then he builds into him a, a new family of characters that surround him and take him in. In fact, they say the reason they're with him is because they're both friends of the same big brother. They're like, we're all friends of Tadashi, they say. We're a kingdom and a compelling community because we're all friends with who? Jesus. That's what unites us. And Jesus would say, even beyond that, Jesus would point to his Father in heaven in Matthew 12. He redefines family, which doesn't mean we neglect those we're related to by blood, but he's stretching out his hand toward his disciples. He said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus said it, we're family. Our key verse in this, as we see what a compelling community looks like, is straight out of Romans 12. It says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another. I, I love this idea of where competition factors into our relationship with Jesus. Out, one, outdo one another in showing honor. That's a, good, that's a good call to competition, isn't it? Not for pride's sake, not to then compare, but if let's run as fast as we can toward being honorable people, loving one another. Don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Probably a few of those we read and we think, yes. And a few of those we read and we think, got to work on that one. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. As we go into our next song here in a few minutes, those who brought offerings to give, we'll give those today. Our ushers can be ready. We'll take that in a few moments here as we move into the next song. Hebrews 10 also gives us Another good way, and this is part of why I think that we, part of the many reasons we gather as a community, as we have the word preached, all of these things. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's why as we consider how that brings us to our next value. How can we do this best? How can we stir one another? What do we do to get there? We actually need fruitful organization as God's people. Say with me together. We articulate a Christ-honoring vision, building congregational ownership in decision-making, engaging conflict constructively, and embracing evaluation as normal and natural in our commitment to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. And glorify him together. Right? We want to consider how best can we serve people this year? How best can we love one another this year? How can we do it organized and well and get the best yield for all of those efforts? The best use of gifts coming together. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That, that describes our church services, but also more, right? Or it ought to. Let's look at the key verse here, 1 Corinthians 4.40. It's short. It's simple. It is to the point. But all things should be done decently and in order. Fruitful organization. 
Right? As a church, we want to be engaged in examination and discussion. Even with the greater church, how can we best band together? How do we work together as a denomination? How do we work together with other local churches? To best organize what does the Bible say we need to get that done? Something that I'm very blessed with all around me here at this church. That would be godly leadership. And this is something that we want to continue to invest in. The deacons and elders we have now and some of you, the deacons and elders yet to come. Say it with me. It says, we believe in training godly servants who lead with character, confidence, and conviction. Establishing a mutual spirit of unity and trust between the leadership and the body. Titus gives us one of several key verses and it says, so you might put what remained into order. There's that idea of organization. And appoint elders in every town as I directed you. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but is hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. So he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Why we seek to act and live as a part of a kingdom community together. That means organized and ever evaluated for the greatest kingdom impact on our surrounding community. Amen? This honors and brings praise to our great God, and he's worthy of that praise. And so the ushers will take an offering as we celebrate that greatness and continue in song with How Great Thou Art. Let's do that now.
Maybe seated. This one's short. It kind of reflects everything we've done up to this point, gathering here today. One of our core values, obviously, is heartfelt worship. And worship can mean, as 1 Corinthians 10 reminds us, whatever we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we do, do it all to the glory of God. Our lives should be lives of worship. But that doesn't, as Hebrews told us earlier, say we neglect the meeting together. That we have a call from, from the time of the Old Testament and God's people all the way up into then after Christ's resurrection and the establishing as we began to be called Christians, little Christs as that means, that we have gathered. Sometimes daily the church has gathered, we see in the book of Acts. We gather at least weekly, although we do other times during the week, but when we do, we recognize God's glory. There are some things we're called to do, as Hebrews said, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. That's why you've heard a psalm today. We've sung some songs today. The opening of God's word is there. Preaching in song. And not always just happy. Not always just an uplift. Because some people come with honest laments. And we need to embody a congregation that can lament together. That can mourn together. But also grow in affection. Let's put it on our lips today and say it together. When we do gather together, we recognize God's glory through adoration and praise. Preaching and song, contrition and lament, growing in affection that stimulates action. Right now, back with our kids, we have uh, one of our newer congregants, Cameron. And I was able to talk with him a little bit just about his life and think about it, just in terms of what we've gone over so far. And because God's word is first and not just in our minds or with our lips, but also then in people living out a life-transforming walk with Jesus and sharing God's good news, one of our other members who worked with him, Cameron looked at him and said, oh, there's a Christian, unlike the other Christian at work, who actually, but oh, he's actually living what he's saying. And he actually is going to talk to me about Jesus. That's what brought him into our church. And that's the story of lots of Christians, not just those who've come to Refuge Church. That when, when you begin to see, oh, no, the word is central in this person because they actually are walking a life-transforming walk with Jesus, and it's truly central. And in fact, they're willing to share with me. And they actually then, they then care about it. Cameron comes, and we've sought to gather in worship and to be organized best we can. Godly leadership. And suddenly then, now he's working and serving a leader in the kids' ministry and helping our kids in our heartfelt and gathered worship. It's the way people come into our community, see that it's a kingdom, and then want to gather with us. And then as we evaluate, even things like today, doing things a little bit different, how, how can and how, what is the variety of ways classic and ancient, modern, in our free ability to dream and plan that we can worship our Lord and Savior. One of our key verses, it's too big for the screen, but I'm going to ask you guys as we walk through 1 Chronicles 16, I'm going to read verses 23 through 36. And maybe just close your eyes, because as I think about why we gather and have our heartfelt worship, this is the heart captured centuries, millennia ago that should undergird that desire to worship together in praise. First, First Chronicles 16 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he's to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory. Do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. 
Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Say also, save us. Save us, O God of our salvation, and gather and deliver us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and ask God to help us to live, to help us to breathe, and to be these values and more for his glory. Let's sing, It's Me, O Lord. and have a seat. <laughs> Up, down, it gets confusing. Standing in the need. That one we had to stand up for. It's interesting. I, I looked up the history of this song. An African-American spiritual, which uh, if we sing it multiple times, maybe we'll actually start to get to those energy levels. <laughs> I, about halfway through, it's starting to work a little bit. Uh, this African-American spiritual is using hyperbole or exaggerating to make a point. The text actually is bringing a very specific message. I need prayer. It's interesting, we, we dealt with this several weeks ago. It came up in one of our messages when Jesus is looking at two men praying. One is the publican. One is a, a Pharisee. and One is just an average Joe. And, and the one guy's praying, saying, you know, thank you, I'm not like all these bad people. It's not really a prayer so much as just boasting. But the prayer of the penitent man is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And sometimes we can. It's not, it's not as if we don't pray for those in need. In fact, the text is bringing this message. 
All the other persons mentioned in the text, as even the, the old history of this song go, people mentioned in the text need prayer as well, but the text stresses the individual's need. And such an understanding of this text permits its use in corporate worship in which we realize this. Each of us needs prayer just as much as all of us need prayer. Amen? The text emphasizes personal responsibility within the larger context of community. It's very easy with prayer requests to say, oh, I know this person and this. What do I need? Am I perfect? Am I wholly sanctified? Some of you know me. Right? We ask for ourselves so God will equip us to be what he tells us to do, right? To be and live and breathe. What? Love God and love my neighbor. I need prayer if I'm actually going to do that in any way that's meaningful, effective, and not self-serving and selfish. That's what we want to be. So we start with that idea. We stand in the need of prayer, asking God to infuse us and empower us and equip us. Why? Because we do want the stranger and the neighbor and everyone. We want to be people who are about transforming communities. Say with me together, this is, this is the goal. We stand in the need of God's prayer because we don't do this every day, but we aspire to this together in which we say we impact the community around us in meaningful ways requiring intentional relationships, sacrificial service, and cheerful hospitality that reflects Jesus' mirth and mercy. Hebrews 3, 6, 13, 16, our key verse, says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. If you always step back a moment from some verses, if Christians were naturally predisposed, oh, great, I'm a Christian now. I'm going to naturally and autonomically do everything as I should the way I ought to, right? We wouldn't need a verse like, don't neglect to do good. It assumes I'm prone to what? Don't neglect to do good and to share what you have because you're prone to slide back. You're prone to atrophy. You're prone to idleness. You're prone to get off track. So I need to ask God, help me because I want to be an intercessor in the lives of others. By God's grace, sometimes we even get to mediate people's issues and problems, step in and be a role like Christ to them. And we get to do those things as extensions of Jesus' love and his grace, and, his, and we get to give his words and his wisdom. Deuteronomy 15, he says, For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. How we strive to do that in very practical ways that open doors so that we can articulate then why we do it. We give. And we don't just give locally. That's why our other value is, is having a global perspective. We just had Suzanne and Andy come back from Cambodia. Andy shared with us a few weeks ago. The global perspective, we say together, that we desire to bless lives outside our community through prayer, through projects, mission work, and ongoing relationships that foster inspiration and involvement of others. Why do you think we do this? Why do you think we do this? So on the one hand, we do it because as someone who's been given a heart by God, I understand on my best days intuitively that it ought to be done. But I also do it because on those days when I'm feeling stubborn or lazy, it's a command to love my neighbor. And Jesus told us why. It's not just so that the neighbor is loved, although that is an effect that God wants. It is not the end unto itself. Our key verse for our global perspective is Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We want good works to be, be we want to have them be seen. And being done by Christians. We're sort of in a touch and go element with that sometimes as Christians in culture today. We think, oh, I want to be humble. I don't, I don't want to do my stuff before men because I don't want to draw attention to myself. Yes, but Jesus says God's people need to be seen doing good works so that it testifies to the fact that they're doing it to imitate Christ. And people will see that and connect that. And give glory to our Father in heaven. We have to juxtapose that with that verse that tells us as we're wrestling with our pride, sometimes we just need to do our things in secret and not draw attention to ourselves. We also need to draw attention to the fact that God has truly changed us. 
that we do truly want to love people as he's loved us. They need to see that. And so the goal is not that I would hide every good thing I do and put on a mask and run around like some kind of quasi-Christian superhero and nobody knows that's really it's James doing any of those things. Otherwise, somebody like Cameron, as I mentioned, might not have come back into the fold. I might not have come back into the fold as a prodigal son when I was 25. I saw a Christian actually living the way they ought to be, and I saw their works being done, and I thought, wait, that actually is what the Bible says, and they're actually living it. Because we have a commission. Matthew 28 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you. And then that promise, Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Good works in a global perspective opens doors for proclamation of why. Our our, Our global perspective is because the Great Commission is global. We want to be God's people, doing the things of God. And as over 2,000 years, it has spread. It has circled the globe more than once, though there are still pockets of unreached peoples and pockets of people who may still be the recipients of our articulation right down the street. We have a great commission from God, and what does he tell us? He tells us, Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Today we have a very special joy, which we do generally once a month, sometimes more. But one thing we were told to do by our God was to do something very specific in remembrance of Him. For all those who believe, One thing we've been commanded to do in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us is we come to the communion table, which we partake of today. So let's look at a few things and prepare our hearts for that. I get to say to you today, grace and peace to you from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say? Amen. Amen. Now in the presence of our Lord, I want to take a few minutes Let's take a moment, ask the Spirit to give us any sins we need to confess before we come to the table this morning. Scripture tells us specifically, if you don't actually believe in Jesus, it says don't partake of the cup. That's like drinking judgment on yourself. It also says examine yourself. Confess your sins before you come to the table so you don't, so you don't take it in an unworthy manner. It's like coming to the table after a hard day's work in the field with your hands unwashed. And everybody else then, as you pass the food, it's just... God God promises He will wash. Let's confess our sins this morning and just take a moment of silence before we come to the table. God bless your people as we partake of communion today. Amen. Let's say this together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With the heavenly host and with the saints of all times and places, let's lift up our hearts in joyful praise, saying together, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit on us today as we pray that the bread that's broken today, the cup that we bless, may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Accept the gift of our lives that we may live in you and serve our kingdom. Let's stand. We'll pass the elements to you today.
thank our Lord before we read the verses and partake of the, the cup and the bread. Father, this morning, we all have reason to thank you. Maybe some of us for very imminent blessings. Maybe some recent change. Maybe for some of us, the way you have been a comfort. The way you have, through someone else, shown us comfort by someone who loves you and does these things in your name. We gotta pray we would not, as we look to the centrality of your word, 
also see in that the centrality of the cross. See the absolute and most central way in which you have loved us and redeemed us, made us complete, made us whole, made us washed again, covered our sins, imputed to us righteousness. To you we appear wearing white, clean, absolutely spotless saints ready for your kingdom. And so we do this today, remembering what Jesus has done. And while we can thank you for so many things, making sure we thank you first and foremost for what you have achieved through your son, Jesus Christ, in your name. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, the same night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We say together. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. In the same manner also, he took the cup when they had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. We say together, the cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We conclude today. We prepare to head out into the world around us. We prepare to see what God has for us in the week to come. God gives us a core value as we put together as a church. We see verses that tell us about what it means to be sacrificial in our lives, generous in the way that we give. So this value we say together, we say that we strive to steward our time, treasure, and talent to bless those beyond our own households using spiritual gifts and financial means collaborating as God's family. I saved this one for last, not because our Deacon Bruce would like some help uh, pulling all the chairs down and stacking them after service. Amen. <laughs> Since, we, since thanks to the offerings and just being good stewards of this space God's given us, we are going to uh, we're gonna have the carpets cleaned in light of VBS and all these other things. So there is a little practical way to live this out. But it's much, much bigger than that. We return to the well that is Romans 12, a real place I love to meditate in Scripture. Verses 1 and 2, this time is our key verse, where God says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That takes meditation, doesn't it? I want to discern what the will of God is for my life, not just what's good, not just what's acceptable. God, show me what's perfect. Now we see it's definitely talking in ways, as we see in Scripture, we're definitely talking about money and goods being used for God's purposes. Another key verse, 2 Corinthians 8, 3, says, They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. And that would have been in the Old Testament, that would have been in New Testament, and even in an Old Testament context, not just coinage, but oftentimes practical things. Livestock, land. Here's a vision from the Old Testament I want to encourage us in as we finish today from Exodus 36, when Moses and God's people, Moses and God's people were commissioned by God to build the tabernacle. He said, Moses called Bezalel and Ohiliab, and every craftsman in whom, whose mind the Lord had put skill. See there, it's also talent, not just treasure. Everyone whose heart stirred him up to come to do the work. And they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. 
They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task he was doing, and said to Moses, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord's commanded us to do. So Moses gave command and word was proclaimed through the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. For the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. What a great day if Christians gave so much. And again, not just money, but in time and talent and treasure to the work of God's kingdom. That somebody, a pastor, uh, just a Christian brother or sister had to say, slow down. You've bringing too much. The joy behind that is, where does the mindset come from? What's the mindset we should be praying for? James 1.17 tells us, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. From him and through him and to him, Scripture tells us, are all things, all things are his. I'm just stewarding them for a little while. Really for a blink when you think about it here in this life. And so may I, may we do so wisely, cheerfully, and sacrificially in his name. Amen? Amen. May we keep our values as God's people in view every day. For those who already filled in all the blanks early, right at the beginning of the sermon, because you knew they were also right there in the inside fold of your bulletin. There's a reason they're there, and there's a reason that we try to keep them central. Website, right there, every week in front of us. Some people have them stuck on their fridge, right? I want to keep those in view every day because I know I am prone to drift. We are prone without the encouragement of one another and without having them in view in this life until someday we stand before the presence of our Lord fully sanctified, fully made, spotless before him on that day they will never be out of view again until then thank you for those of you who inspire me to keep them in view and may we do so together let's close together then with a simple classic and ancient doxology and end our time of service together Grace and peace to all of you. May you have a great week and where we intersect as brothers and sisters. May those times be an encouragement as well. Take care.